since we are in, you know, the state of New York, you guys, you two came from New Jersey. What, what was the reasoning behind that? The move in general towards New York was to be near what was considered the mecca of music, you know? Uh, like, there's the mecca of basketball, the mecca of music. <laughs> it's, there's a dream out there, and I think it's been there. Um, it's, it's found its way into Greenwich Village, and then it moved to all sorts of places. It found its way to Williamsburg, and I think it's moved again, and I don't know where it is, but it basically goes where it's cheap enough to survive and live and make art, but it's not so expensive that you can't be there anymore. And so I kind of moved in, trying to find myself and find my place and all that, and it was tough because it was basically, I worked three jobs and didn't really have much time to do my art. And so uh, I was sort of priced out. And, and I moved westward with Jeremiah and we found Nilo once we moved there. Well, what was the Brooklyn vibe for you when you were working here and living here? I was living in Bushwick. I would commute like all around back into other parts of Brooklyn. Uh, I worked in Williamsburg. That's a different vibe than the other part of Brooklyn I worked in, which was by the Brooklyn Supreme Court and the tech technical school. So, it's kind of a really diverse borough, so it would be hard to sum it up in one building. What's the most frustrating question? I'm sure you guys have been asked this many times, but was it the, the question of why would you leave New York City, the place of dreams, or the question of why did you choose Denver? Which one is more frustrating for you to answer? I don't know. I don't, I've never been frustrated by it because I think, I think people are generally interested to know why we did leave New York City. I don't think it's necessarily rhetorical, I think. It was just to eliminate distractions, and I think to eliminate that, the main distraction of money, which is so blinding for an artist up and coming. You, you need to make money, but you need to work so many jobs to live in an expensive city, so that didn't seem to make sense to us. We talked about the idea that if we put 40 hours into busing tables and serving coffee and serving drinks, but we only put five hours into music that How week. How could it work? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna be a lot better at serving drinks than we are at making music. For you, Neil, being in Denver, did you feel a sense of passion and, and, and want to, to be part of something musically? Or did this kind of just, I know you answered an ad um, through Craigslist, which as a woman, I don't know how you were brave enough to do that, because if I saw some random ad like that, I don't know if I would answer necessarily. But did you, is this something that you'd always dreamed to do, or how did this all come about? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no. So you're just the luckiest girl ever. <laughs> yeah, no, I got a teaching degree and I was going to be a teacher, but I uh, didn't get hired right away. And so I was just kind of looking for something to pass the time. And I had a lot of friends in bands and I went to shows a lot, but as a cellist, I didn't really picture myself lending those kind of skills to any sort of like pop or like, you know, alternative, any sort of mainstream music you know so it was it was weird to uh, enter a band as a cellist it just never crossed my mind before what was that that kind of glued you guys together and where you had a moment where you knew that the three of you and I know you have touring members as well but the three of you were the core and that that this could work and potentially become very successful I think touring was a, was a big part of that I mean we spent we spent a lot of time together in the last couple of years and it's an interesting job to have because your coworkers are also your roommates and you're financially tied and you have this artistic connection as well and so it's a really complicated relationship but um, the fir very first tour we did was about 30 days out in a minivan um, with all of our gear <laughs> packed to the gills and um, we came back and we wanted to do it again and you know we spent every second together so I think that was a good sign that this was at least a good relationship. To go to these you know tour with bands like Dave Matthews and, and be at concerts like Bonnaroo. Um, it's a surreal moment for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I it's also, both, so it's, it's very cool. normal too. It's weird. It's like, it's very surreal and it's also, we're professional musicians now. This is what we do and it's sort of strange to get that ingrained because I've done, we've all done a lot more. We've not been professional musicians. Uh, you know, we did a lot of side jobs and stuff before this, so we try to make it seem normal at least. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember growing up, I went to like three Dave Matthews shows with all, because all my friends were into Dave Matthews band growing up. So we all went to Giant Stadium and it was this sort of, there was a culture around it and all these high school kids would just hang out in the parking lot and a lot of those people will be here tonight for the show and I think they're pretty pumped. I, I just, to me, it's just so interesting to, to, to see that transition happen, you know, from being a, an everyday person, you still are an everyday person. It's just now people are more curious and interested about you. It was an interesting moment the other night. Dave Matthews was playing, you know, 
and I, I went out to go see the song number 41 and I was telling Wes that when you're side stage and we've all met the members it's it's very demystifying you know they're like a normal person you know they eat and they sleep and they're very normal but then as soon as I went to the front to like actually watch <clears throat> the show and like the lights are going and the sound immediately he became that celebrity that I once saw as like a teenager. There's a shift. Do you think that everybody's capable of, of finding that other character or do you have to have that special X factor? I don't know. I Some think I'm like the most much. unlikely person to be an entertainer. I'm very introverted. So. Well hold on actually I heard that in high school you were voted best looking and best smile. I told you this you stuff. What? <laughs> Who told you this stuff? I have my sources. Oh. I am Russian, so I, I'm a spy. Yeah, I have my sources. Mediocre looking high school, no offense. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I was very, I was very introverted though, and I, I still am, and so it's a very, I think it's something where I remember the day of shows every day. I couldn't eat like the whole day, and I couldn't sleep well and everything. And then as time wore on and tried it over and over, it was like a muscle that you got into shape, and you got more and more used to performing. And in other people, it comes really naturally and easily, and I'm not that. So I don't think it's an X factor, but I think people with that have an advantage because they don't really have to not eat it for an entire day or lose sleep. A lot of the lyrics, to me at least, they question feelings. But in the song of Scotland, you say, you could never feel my story. Why is it important for somebody to feel your story? Well, what I've learned as we've written songs is that it's it's almost more important that someone feels something with their own story related to what you put out there. And it's this almost reactionary thing or that you're almost inciting someone to feel something uh, by your own experience because you could name a specific name in a song and they'll, they'll rename it in their own heads to mean somebody else in their life or a city or uh, very specific things are so flexible in people's minds. And it's kind of what's really nice about going through all this is that people are relating to things and taking their own spin on it. But at the time, it, that, that lyric and those things were written from a place of just basically feeling so strongly about what we were doing, it just felt, you know, we were just against the world or underdogs. And that's never kind of left how I feel. It's really weird to be headlining some nights. It's exhausting sometimes because I'm so used to just trying to convince people to get with this music and um, win them over as opposed to they're in your back pocket in a way, or they're right with you from the first word out of your mouth. And it's different, you know.